Hi, Laura. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Jason. Thanks so much for having me on. Such an honor. Yeah, well, I am excited to talk to you about your favorite muscle of all time, the psoas. So thanks for being here. Thanks again so much. It is my favorite muscle. Um, I'm sure we'll get into all of that and why, uh, but especially for my runners, I'll put it that way. Yeah, well, it was interesting when I was doing some research for this conversation because I started looking at a bunch of your Instagram content and I'm like, oh, wow, she actually has a multi-part series on the SOAS. So this is going to be a, a very good conversation. Uh, but let me just preface this by saying I'm, I'm a bit embarrassed to say that you know, if you were to ask me where the psoas muscle is, I wouldn't have a great answer for you. So I'm coming into this conversation without much foundational knowledge on the psoas. So thank you for helping me understand. Um, and maybe we can start just like super general, you know, like what is the psoas muscle muscle and, and where is it? Yeah, well, just backing up a little bit, um, I, I started that short series um, that you mentioned because I had a little flare up of my own psoas and I'm like, oh, people need to know. I was in a race, I was doing a 5K and I'm like, oh, this is so pain. It can be painful, but it's not only about it being painful on its own. Uh, it can lead to a lot of other things. So, um, yeah, and I beca become very passionate over my career as a physical therapist and a specialist in, in a, um, a few areas, this being one, because it seems so overlooked and like unknown. Like, I almost want to ask you, Jason, what do you know when you hear so as what, what do you know? Not to put you on the spot or anything, but. I love being put on the spot on my own <laughs> podcast. So <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> The, the psoas muscle is is in your core area. It's on the front side of your body, or at least that's how you would typically access it. And I have no idea what it does. I just know that there are some torture devices out there in the world to dig into the psoas, which really just looks like you're stabbing yourself in the stomach. That is the extent of my psoas muscle knowledge. That's pretty good, Jason, actually. And I think that you're that, that I would say you you're at the top end of uh, some of the patients who come in who like have never heard of it, never, you know, considered even the front side of the spine. And I'll talk about that a bit more here too. So we can think about the core and yes, it's on the front side. And so this OS for those of you who aren't aware of it or have never heard of it, it has this funny spelling, P-S-O-A-S. -S, and it is uh, I always want to say what it's not. It's not just a hip flexor. Some people and practitioners will, you know, dig into the stomach area, the core or the hip itself and just think it's a hip, you know, thing. So the front of your hip, if you've ever had, a, you know, a, you know, a body worker dig into the front of your hip, that's not exactly wrong, but it's not the whole story. So it kind of feels like to me the so as like people kind of know a little bit about it and it's gaining some popularity. Um, but it's still highly misunderstood. So what it is, is a lumbar stabilizer on the front side of the spine. So most of us think about the back muscles. So even if you put your you know, thumbs on the back beside your spine, you're gonna feel your back muscles, the lumbar paraspinals back there, your low back, and those muscles go all the way up to the neck, right? But on the front side of the spine, going from your pelvis, even your pubic bone, and up to the rib, bottom of the rib cage even, is the psoas and it's a front stabilizer. So I like to say it's deep to or underneath the the typical core muscles we think about, right? So it's deep to or underneath or beneath the um, you know rectus abdominis, those six pack abs we think about, even the transversus abdominis, and it's deep to or underneath the intestines, which are really malleable and squish out of the way when I press into the area. But you're not wrong at all. It's in this abdomen area and think from the, um, yeah, the level of the pelvis up to the rib cage, but more central. So if we can imagine a, imagine a zipper line down the center of your body and just go to the right or left of it, maybe an inch, not much more. And then you're going to be right on top of the psoas muscle. It is deeper, but it doesn't mean it can't be accessed. Um, so, so the other really important thing about the psoas, so it attaches to each lumbar vertebrae and its disc all the way along the front side of the spine. Um, I'm gonna use some of my diagrams here because those of you watching, this will become very interesting. So it's actually attached to each vertebrae and its disc all the way along the front side. And this is the cut version over here. You can see that. And then it comes down, it crosses the hip joint and attaches to the upper part of the leg on the femur called the lesser trochanter of the femur for my fellow anatomy nerds out there. 
Um, so because it crosses the hip joint and because it's attached to the spine, it's basically a muscle group attaching the spine to the leg on each side, left and right. And because it crosses the hip joint and no other muscle group does that front or back side, anytime we sit, we're shortening it. Anytime we walk or run or lift the leg, we're working it, shortening it. Every time we slouch in our posture, it gets shortened and tightened. And then if we say sit at a desk job and you know shorten the psoas for hours at a time and we go up to run and we have some biomechanical imbalances, that's gonna really affect you know, your, a lot of many things, alignment, biomechanics, how you land on your foot when you're running, um, posture, breathing, shoulders, there's just a lot that it can tie into. So it seems like the psoas is a stabilizing muscle primarily for the spine. Am I understanding that right? Yes. Okay. So and obviously important for runners, you know, we want stable we're, spines. And we're moving we're forward right so um it's a stabilizing muscle for the spine also means it flexes us forward right um and then it stabilizes us from, us from falling backward is one way to put it and then it also helps so it helps to rotate us left and right and it, and side bend left and right it also helps to lift the leg wow. so it's a spinal oh, stabilizer and so a much. hip flexor yeah simply because of the attachments Oh yeah. The attachments. And so that's because it runs almost the entire length of, of your torso connecting from not just your spine, but also you mentioned your ribs as well. It connects to the ribs and underneath no. your pelvis. Yeah. Not quite to the ribs, Jason, more, I uh, think below your rib cage, um, more central or medial and it's, but it's attached uh, below, like if I work on someone on the psoas, I'll work from the pelvis all the way up to the bottom of their rib cage. And um, so it's attached to the spine, but all the way up the front side of the spine. So if you think of your low back, the lumbar vertebrae, do we wrap around the front of that? It's pretty high up below the rib cage. So L1 is our lumbar vertebrae one, and then T12 is the low thoracic. And so we're still right in that area where those two parts of the spine meet. I'll diagram again. So the psoas is here's the bottom of the thoracic vertebrae, lumbar L1. Here's the bottom of the rib cage. And so it's attached to the spine and each disc, um, but all the way up to the rib cage. So we want to think of that whole abdomen area on the front. So what does what kind of problems do runners typically have with the psoas muscle? And, and maybe you can use yourself as a little bit of a case study because you said you, ha you had a flare up recently, I think uh, after a, a 5k race that you ran. During. I'm just curious, you know, like, <laughs> is this, is this something that gets strained? Is it, does it get overused like a, a typical repetitive stress injury that a lot of distance runners will be familiar with? Cause it doesn't really seem like the muscle that would typically get injured in runners. So I'm just curious if you do injure it or hurt it in some way, what does that look like? I would say it's less about the psoas specifically being injured or hurt and more about its dysfunction, creating a whole slew of other in injuries, especially any kind of uh, chronic or pattern type of injury, overuse injuries, at least for me as a runner, those are all the kind of injuries I, usually had more than anything else. And so if there's a pattern problem that's continuing to perpetuate, the psoas usually has a lot to do with that. So it's less the psoas itself. Few people will feel it itself. You'll feel the most common, like if I were to pick, someone comes into my clinic and uh, they have the, they present with these problems or these symptoms, I'd be like, you definitely have a a tense or tight or dysfunctional psoas. And that would be low back pain, something like sciatica or um, hip pain, but then also like unexplained knee pain or lower leg, foot, ankle, plantar fasciitis, any of those things can stem from the imbalances created by a dysfunctional psoas. Oh boy. It sounds like if you have a problem with your psoas, it could leach out into almost any other area of your body and just cause this cascading effect of other types of injuries. We don't want that. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about how to prevent all those kinds of problems. Um, 
you know, and this is where like, I, I just love the topic of building injury resilience, building injury prevention efforts into our training. But when it comes to the psoas, you know, I, I'm a little bit at a loss. This is such a deep muscle. It seems like a muscle that you don't actively strengthen because it just seems, you know, so deep, you could really strengthen it almost any weighted exercise where you're standing, it seems like, but, you know, tell us a little bit more about, you know, if, if you're currently healthy, but you want to prevent any psoas problems, what might be some of the best strategies in your mind? Yeah, there's a lot there. And I love everything that you're saying and picking up on. Um, where I want to begin is, um, <laughs> there is a lot there. I, um, I love asking extremely <laughs> open-ended loaded questions to see where the guest takes it. So full disclosure, Great. I am setting you up with a tough Great. one. <laughs> well, you, I was like going to answer that and then that and then that and that. Well, oh, okay. Like, where am I now? Um, so one thing that I've um, really discovered in my work with this muscle is a shift from thinking about a shift in the way I think about muscle function. So um, I, one thing I love about your podcast is it's such a strength training component to that. I've always loved, I've never been a runner who was like, I hate strength training. I am the runner who is like, um, ever since high school, college, post-collegially, I've always had strength training incorporated. It's just shifted in certain ways at different times. I've also been a personal trainer. I also, you know, studied exercise physiology. So it all um, came in. But what I've learned, at least with this muscle, and I do believe it extrapolates out to a lot of other muscle function, if we just talk about it at the tissue level, is we need muscles to be healthy and strengthened and strong. But a dysfunction can really occur, particularly with the psoas, is it, if, it, if it becomes dysfunctional, short, tight, and not able to move very well. So the biggest thing I would point to with runners and injury prevention, if you're healthy, is keep the muscles healthy, not only strong, but also long, not just strengthening, but also lengthening. If we always contract, which we do as runners, and then we go to strengthen and contract, and then we go and sit and shorten, so any static position or repetitive or isometric muscle contraction can create a imbalance and stiffness. Um, and so keeping everything kind of open, loose, uh, the term I like to use with muscle is pliable. It's still different from flexible. We can think of yoga with flexibility. I consider yoga to be a, a strengthening exercise in many ways at the muscle tissue level, um, certain kinds at least. So if we're contracting muscle, it's gonna, it could create imbalances. So we want to keep balancing muscle contraction with muscle expansion. And because we're runners, we tend to focus on our legs a lot, you know, because we feel soreness and tension and problems in our legs, quads, hamstrings, you know, calves, glutes, string, you know, um, but if we focus on the spine a bit more, like the health of the spine and the muscles around it and the nerves in the area, which I love to talk more about because we have to remember muscles aren't just in a vacuum by themselves. They're, they're connected and they're also connected to other systems. So if we think the muscular system, it controls or moves around the skeletal system and it's run by the nervous system. The nervous system gets overlooked a lot. So we want to keep in this center of the body. If we take kind of a center out perspective rather than a down from the feet up or a top down, we have a center out from the center of the body. The spine, hips, and pelvis are this place that affect our posture, our form. It can impact our breathing, where our shoulders sit, ability to swing the arms, ability to rotate the hips and spine and get the rotational momentum, range of motion of the hips. There's a lot in this area. So imagine if we oh, just emphasize a little bit more of the health and um, length and not just strength, right? But like length and movement of the spine area, front and back, side to side, rotationally, we can potentially stave off a lot more, particularly lower extremity injuries along the way. Yeah, I want to ask you a little bit more about both lengthening and strengthening the psoas. But before we do that, can you let me know, like, is, is there any ability to diagnose whether or not you have a long and pliable, I, I like the term supple, mm -hmm. but same thing, mm -hmm. uh, a, a pliable long psoas that is strong and functional versus 
you know, someone who may have some issues. Because, you know, there's a lot of other exercises that you can do or, or sort of diagnostic screens to tell you, do I have, you know, a, a certain tightness or imbalance or weakness in, in other muscles? Is there something similar for the psoas? Well, um, what I would say in terms of just simple things I could have a patient do um, is, you know, if you lean backwards and you feel any pressure in your back, then you probably have some tension or tenderness in the psoas. Now, if you do it in a sitting position, your hips are flexed, so it's already put on slack. Um, so your hips are flexed. So you, if you stand up and, you know, arch back gently, and if you have any pressure or pain in the low back, that can indicate a psoas issue. If you were to simply, um, as I do kind of yoga mobility classes in this way, lay on a ball. It doesn't have to be a really hard lacrosse ball. It can be something squishier. You can kind of work um, through, assess through that area yourself to see, oh, are there any areas of tension or tenderness? Um, so there are a couple of simple things like that, that I would suggest. Okay. So it sounds like maybe like if you don't have any major problems, or if you can't feel any tenderness or tightness or pressure, you're probably okay. And, and you don't need to take any drastic interventions to deal with the psoas in any kind of way. I would agree with that. Unless you have knee pain, ankle pain, <laughs> hip pain, or even subtle things that are starting to come on and accumulate, then it might be worth taking a look closer, more closely. Okay. Got it. Yes. I need to remember that this can, this can affect almost everything, right? This can lead to a lot of, yeah, other imbalances. Cause think of it this way. This is a really good biomechanical example. So because the muscle attaches, um, from the spine to your leg and any muscle that shortens brings the two bones that's attached to closer together, right? So just like the bicep shortens and brings the, you know, forearm closer to the shoulder, um, this will roll the hip in and up roll the knee inward, internally rotating the femur. We tend to compensate by landing more on the outside of the foot. And then we can have lots of pressure on the medial knee, which is very common. We can have, gosh, um, like posterior tibial tendon issues. We can have plantar fasciitis. So, as, and so I would say, even if you start to notice, and sometimes it's hard to pick up on, that you're running, landing more on the outside of the foot, it can be an indication that your hips are becoming more tight and that your psoas is becoming more tight. This is probably a really good advertisement for any injury prone runner who's dealing with some problems to go see a good physical therapist who works with runners, who understands runners, because they're just going to have a much more holistic view of the demands of the sport on the human body and, and all of the interconnected problems or issues that might be affecting how you're feeling on a given day. So yeah. Let's now assume that, okay, someone does have some psoas problems. They've come into your office and you're like, okay, this person needs to both strengthen and lengthen their psoas. What are some of the best ways to do that? Well, I back up a couple steps there, Jason, again. Well, first, I love what you said about um, seeing a PT and having this holistic sense, especially, um, under, especially important to understand our love for running, like the desire, what it brings us, the being outside that, you know, so when someone comes in with an injury that's taking them out of it, it's really hard. It really sucks. I've been there plenty of times and I, um, I do appreciate, um, you know, helping people through that place too, and take the steps to become confident again. And then as far as the psoas, if someone comes in, they usually, they won't know that they have a psoas injury in most cases. Once in a while, someone will actually feel like I did in that last mile of race of a 5K where it was like, oh my gosh, this muscle is cramping. But it that actually brings to my mind when I was in high school and had a lot of side stitches and I always thought it was breathing or something like that. And now knowing what I know now, it was most likely a cramping of this muscle, this front stabilizer of the spine. Right? So it's not able to move properly, which means it's trying so hard to get your legs with this range of motion and this repetition. And so it's not able to move properly. So you, normally when someone comes in, they have something else, back pain, hip pain. Um, they've been diagnosed with plantar fasciitis. They have unexplained knee pain. They got an MRI. It looks clean and good. And they're like, I don't know what's going on. Those are my favorite kinds of injury, kinds of problems. Cause I'm like, I know what to do. And it's a lot of times a matter of releasing this muscle. I could most of the time predict that they're going to have some issue at some level. And it's going to, 
it depends on the person, how they're presenting and their um, particular imbalances and histories and prior injuries and how they sit and their dominant hand, all those things affect where they're getting patterned with this muscle. And the muscle itself, rather than again, needing strengthening, it, it mostly needs restoration of function, meaning the ability to become soft and pliable again. It's become dormant, hard, tight. It's not like an active contraction, but it's more like it's not expanding. And so when I assess someone and I press on the muscle, it will feel tight and tender. And sometimes they want to like, you know, punch me in the face. No, <laughs> but, um, but then it can be reeducated and we can make that um, soften and improve. And it's not just the muscle. So again, we're not, it's not in a vacuum. We, part of what's so important about the psoas and iliacus muscles, it's kind of like a sidekick we're not talking about. The iliacus attaches from the pelvis to the leg and forms a common attachment. Um, but in the area of the psoas on this front side of the spine is where the lumbar plexus of nerves exits the spinal cord and controls all the muscles in the torso front and back and down the legs. So sometimes I'll have patients come in with, uh, some of my runners have common issues with like a calf cramping. That kind of takes them out of running for a while, especially my male runners in their 50s and 60s. Um, or they just, they or I had a, recently had a, um, a retired, uh, you know, pro triathlete. So she knows her body really well. And she'd had a prior knee injury and she came, uh, she came in and she, um, actually met her in the gym. We were both strengthening. And, <laughs> and she, she said, I can tell that this one side, like my left side just isn't kicking in on single leg activities like lunges or single leg squats. And she's like, I can just tell this subtle difference where it's not kicking in. This is where the nerves that control the muscles become important. So a lot of what I do isn't just releasing the psoas, it's connecting the muscle to the nerve elect electrical pathway, connect, reconnecting the nerve to the muscle to get it to change long-term. So whenever someone has like, oh, my glutes aren't fully functioning or firing or my quads aren't fully functioning or firing, or my hamstring is staying tight and short and I get the high hamstring issue, there's usually more to it than just that area. And so often people and practitioners, we get so focused on this, we learn to get so focused on the symptoms and where the pain is, it's easy to miss all of this connectivity that's going on. Not just, again, the psoas being such an important part of that, but the nerves that are in the same areas of psoas. So part of taking care of that muscle is not, uh, is preventing nerves from being pinched or, um, you know, becoming dysfunctional themselves and then limiting your ability to strengthen properly, actually fully, full function. We can't, if we have, we, if we don't have full nerves function to a muscle, we can only get so far with strengthening. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I, and I think one that often we athletes don't really think about, you know, especially runners, you know, we used to think of ourselves as like heart and lungs, you know, on two legs. And now we're like, okay, well, you know, our muscular strength is, is important too. We have to get in the gym, you know, that's an important part of our physical fitness, you know, and, and as a running coach, I'm very aware of training my athletes nervous system, uh, especially my, you know, middle distance folks who are doing really short and fast things. And so I understand how it, it's so important, but we rarely think about this from an injury treatment or building resilience perspective. So I'm really interested in this idea of training the nerves around the psoas to make the psoas more functional, to restore yeah. that function, like you said. What, what do you do for that? I mean, is this just an issue of manipulating the nerves and sort of, quote unquote, waking them up a little bit? Or are, are you doing something more formal down there to restore the function of that muscle? A um, couple of things. So yes, I love what you say about with running training. There's so much um, great new thought processes and coaching the, how the nervous system impacts the rest of the body training, physiology, and mechanics, right? And so we can say the same thing about um, the mechanical systems of the body, right? Not just the physiological systems, but the mechanical systems will be that much more fully functioning if we have the nerves um, fully getting to the muscles, right? 
um, which will fully allow joints to work properly. I always like to tell my patients uh, to, well, I'm a nerve focused physical therapist for this reason, because we can only get so far with a muscle if we, if we don't treat the nerve. So um, this nerve piece is first nerve to muscle, then bone goes nerve muscle bone um as in a nerve tells a muscle to pull a bone in that order if we just worked with the joint we, we might get some relief but it won't take us all the way if we you know mobilize the muscle that can help too we can get some blood flow and things but so often i find that we need to deal with the nerve first and so how how i've learned to do this is to um like re-educate re-engage the muscle hands-on so it could be a, the calf it could be the psoas it could be you know um I work with the neck a lot too for anyone with um, shoulder, um, elbow, hand, or numbness sorts of things, um, because similarly all the nerves in the, down the arms begin in the neck, just like in the psoas, those, that lumbar plexus controls everything down into the legs. So work um, by holding pressure on a muscle to allow time for the nerve to reconnect to it. Um, and that's one thing, but if there's nerve swelling, then we need to uh, help the inflammation, reduce inflammation on the nerve. So I give people a really specific way to ice that's for nerve, not for blood flow. So everyone's caught, everyone gets caught up in the um, blood flow system. So it's not for circulation, which does make sense. Heat and cold for circulation. This is for nerve swelling. And this is what helps it take so much better. And so our bodies, as we're moving and exercising and working out and running, we, that's an inflammatory process amongst many other things. So if someone, if I, someone comes in as a patient for whatever injury they have, knee problems, hip problems, you know, back problems, um, they, and I assess them and their psoas is very, very tight and limited. Part of what helps is getting the nerves to, uh, to become open again. So unlike blood vessels that expand with, uh, with swelling, right? So we heat, we get swelling, blood flow improves, the vessels expand. Nerves pinch, they close inward. So if we have swelling in the area of the nerves, then we are closing them down, not allowing that electrical signal to get to the muscles the way we need to. That includes the legs, that includes the psoas too. So when yeah so that's a way to heal and restore it's also a great way to um to prevent and recover right from a hard workout or things that um are uh do it, like recover and restore our muscles to the natural you know position length ability so that they can adapt and improve and all those things i really like this this mindset or or framework of nerves to muscle to bone. And, and really it's the nerves that are, uh, essentially carrying out the communication of our brain to mm -hmm. recruit certain muscle fibers, to, to work a certain muscle, you know, to, um, contract those fibers. It's very interesting because, you know, if someone starts lifting weights, most of their gains in the first month or so are like nervous system gains. It's yeah. really just teaching your brain to better recruit your muscle fibers through those electrical signals through your nerves. It's, it's, you're not actually like getting stronger muscles or building any kind of additional muscle size. Really, you're just kind of improving the way your brain interacts with your muscles. And I just find that so fascinating. And it, you know, it's clear that this has an application when it comes to injuries too. Now I've got to ask you about icing in a specific way for the nerves. What are we doing there? Is this, is this, is this just a bag of ice on our, our stomach for the psoas? <laughs> How does that work? Uh, it is two big ice packs, one on the front, one on the back, but only for five minutes at a time and more frequently throughout the day to get the long-term changes my patients need to get after they've usually these kinds of problems in the back, hips, long-term problems are, have accumulated over time. And so we want to take the time when you're injured. This is a good, um, you know, good, good process to think of in, for anyone when we're injured. And most runners are and get there at some point, but unless you're really durable, which I was never a durable runner. Um, it's a good time to reset the whole system. So if we get injured, there's probably some, there's probably something going on, unless it was something more acute, like a fall or a fracture or something like that. Or me last year stepping on a rock and fracturing my ankle um and, 
but um, there's usually some like thing accumulating and coming on, right? So any injury is a good time to reset and restore the system, starting with the, the nerves, how they interact with the muscles, and especially from the center of the body out, right? So the nerves in the center of the body control all the muscles in the torso and down the legs. So if we want full function in all those great leg muscles and everything else, of course, too, posturally, um, we want to start there. So, um, so for someone who has a really dysfunctional, so as muscle, I felt it, I can tell, they can tell because it hurts and it's not uh, you know, responding very quickly. That tells me something about the the nerve connection to the muscle, then icing in this particular way it really helps restore that. But I do it a lot too, just as a recovery. I'm, I'm always pushing my body in some way or another. Um, still running, but less 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 uh, competitively than I once did. But um, I wish I'd known this when I was a lot younger. So rather than sitting in an ice bath for 15 minutes after practice, like I did all through college, I would do more frequent, less l l higher frequency, less duration icing where it counts. Yeah, that seems to me a little bit more strategic and you're not getting that that global anti-inflammation uh mm -hmm. stimulus where which you know a lot of folks have now discovered uh mm -hmm. can actually blunt the adaptation process. So, right. you know, every time you go for a long run or do a faster workout, you don't want to just dunk your entire body in an ice bath right afterwards because some of that inflammation, some of that micro trauma in your muscles, you know, those are all signals that help your body come back stronger and, and get those beneficial adaptations that we're looking for. Um, exactly. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about inflammation because it seems mm -hmm. like, you know, if someone comes in with a problem and you determine that it's their psoas, mm -hmm. if they have inflammation in the psoas, is, is that the time to deal with the inflammation first before you get in there and do any kind of manipulation of the tissue? Because it seems to me that that might be counterproductive or it might increase inflammation or otherwise just maybe even just be uncomfortable. Right. I uh, Well, personally, because I've been doing this so long, I do a little bit of both right away. But if, I, if someone were doing something on their own, I would definitely say we've got to get the inflammation down to really make the progress. Otherwise, one, you, you might um, this, yeah, irritate something more. Yeah, and depending, it depends a little on what they're coming in with. But that's a really important um, thing that I've been thinking about and writing about for a long time, this or sequence of events, just like in training where we wouldn't want to, you know, dump everything in all at once necessarily, right, in terms of running training, we want to have a little bit of an intention as far as healing. So especially from injury, right? We're, we're, there's a prevention side. Okay. We're doing mostly okay, but we can kind of have those routines and habits that help us keep going. Um, maybe it's mobility, maybe it's a little more icing, things like that. But if someone's, you know, injured or been, been taken out of running for a bit, um, we want to really start with that. I could feel when they're swelling in the muscle area because it'll feel swollen. It'll feel like a bubble kind of feeling. And so we really want to take that um, swelling down. And it's 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 part of my uh, the part of the fun of my job is to remind people and keep encouraging them if they don't want to and we need to just like those things that all of us runners maybe don't want to have to the simple yet very important things that um, keep us running right long term and I think those are the most important things the simplest most foundational things if you have any problem any limitation an injury it becomes an injury it's like come back down to the simplest most foundational things it's like base aerobic miles you always need that right um before we layer on the all the other things the speed the strength and all that stuff we're going to have a higher um a higher output or ability if we have those foundational things and i think i do believe the nerve the healthy nervous system healthy nerve to muscle connections is that foundation when it comes to the mechanics of the body and then back to what you said about strengthening um uh it made me think of yeah so you yeah we make neuromuscular adaptations right away when someone's new to strengthening same when someone's recovering from an injury um i'll use myself as an example last year i sprained and fractured my ankle by running stepping on a rock i was off the icy trails and off the icy track and somehow just fluke stepped on rock. But it was really good for me because I went through the whole process myself. And you do like to be the kind of PT who practices what I preach. So I really wanted to, you know, heal this well and fully and take all the right steps. But I noticed, you know, for a while there was this fuzzy, I couldn't 
you know, even when the ankle was more healed, it still took a while to be able to balance on that side, single leg stance, and then uh, um, progress to more you know, unstable surfaces, and then to be able to do single leg exercises, like even double leg, but lunges, and then all the way up to impact training, and, you know, all the way along the, the way, you, you, what's so fascinating to me to feel it is to, um, you know, not be able to do something, practice a skill, practice a skill, practice a skill. And then the next day it's like, oh, I can do that now. And it's a very subtle, but very important and rewarding place to be. So anyone who's injured out there, like, you know, it can be this interesting process to, to, um, to feel your body more and feel how it can adapt and change even in the subtlest of ways, even with the tedious PT exercises that, that you have to do in order to get there or the tedious things we have to do or it helps to do, right? Uh, and we're, we're running training to keep our bodies healthy. We're asking, we're actually asking a lot of it. I always have. I'm like, oh, right. I also need to do things that help support it rather than just asking so much of it took me a long time to really totally um, acknowledge that for myself. Yeah, me too. I think, I think both of us uh, competed uh, at, at a time when the focus was on hard workouts and mileage and no pain, no gain. And now there's a much healthier relationship with the sport where we do recognize how difficult it is. And we then have to do all those supporting things, which keep us healthy. And, and maybe to put a bow on this conversation, to tie it up at the end here, um, let's talk about some of those things. Let's get super mm -hmm. actionable. Um, let, let's imagine that someone comes to you. Uh, mm -hmm. They are healthy. They want to not only prevent a, a psoas injury, but you know, they just kind of want to stay healthy in general. Uh, mm -hmm. But with the perspective of a little bit more focus on the psoas, what are some things that you like to see included in runner's training that isn't just long runs and fast workouts. Uh, you know, the things that we all know as runners, we've got to do to become better runners. You know, I know you mentioned yoga earlier, so I'm just curious, like, are there other forms of cross training or certain strength exercises or flexibility movements or, you know, anything like that, that might be particularly helpful for this specific problem? Yeah, sure. Again, there's a lot there. Um, I, I almost want to go from, you mentioned fast running and, or, you know, long runs and workouts, volume and workouts and go backwards. So then there's, you know, we all want to have good warm ups, good um, dynamic mobility, dynamic strength, strength training. Um, so backwards as far as like foundation, right? So to be able to do those things, then we need to have really good healthy working um, systems, nervous system, muscular system, skeletal system. Um, that, so then that would be look like, um, mo like it could be soft tissue mobility and those things the, the specific, and then I'll go back just a little bit. So then it's the basic health, right? Nutrition, sleep, rest. <laughs> but what I like to, I think of it like a pyramid. So we've got the baseline of basic health, blood pressure, heart rate, all those things are healthy. We're not injured. Right. And then, and then we've got, you know, fitness and, um, and, skill but there's a middle place um, so so there's basic like basic health we've got strength and fitness skill but in the middle there uh, above basic health i like to put these kind of systems and so to keep the nerves muscles um, skeletal system healthy that means posture range of motion but not just like movement oriented uh, simpler passive. So keep, we could add the icing, you know, maybe not to the same degree. I'd have someone who comes in with an injury and we want to, like, I really want them to get through this, um, you know, in a couple of months and back to being able to move. So, but we could keep some of those things in as that recovery place, right? I would lump it in with recovering the body so that it can keep working out and keep getting those super compensations we want to get. Um, so icing the five minutes of time for nerves, not muscle it's okay to ice in other ways. We need that for, you know, certain injuries and things, but um, this is a really good, you know, again, get the, the nerve plexus, um, keep it from being uh, swollen and inflamed. Um, the other thing I would include for people, so just like I uh, prescribe icing in a different way for a different purpose than we're used to hearing, I also prescribe stretching in a different way 
for a different purpose than what we're used to hearing. We're used to thinking of stretching like pull, you know, pull, create resistance, a mild resistance. All my ex-phys textbooks said stretch to the point of mild resistance. All the research is kind of, you know, fuzzy because it's all looking at it from the same creating resistance, or at least in my mind, that's why it's all fuzzy. Oh, we don't know when or how. It's because everyone's creating resistance. It's still like muscle tension. We can stretch, or I like to say elongate or lengthen just to distinguish it from a pulling type of thought mindset. It's do stretches that are like you do the same stretch, but you back off into well, it's where it's comfortable. You use walls and put your leg up on the back of the car or on a you know table, and you and more freak more repetitions and more um, gentle. Okay, so just like we need to uh, repetition to strengthen a muscle, we also need repetition to lengthen a muscle. And if we go say from sitting in a car to get to maybe a trailhead or go to a run wherever we're meeting people. And to spend like five minutes doing these very simple lengthening, super comfortable, just for getting muscles to relax and lengthen again, or before we move, you're gonna feel so much better when you start moving. Um, and it could be a really good habit, just like brushing our teeth, to get into where it doesn't take as much time until we haven't done these things and we have to like do a ton of it um, to get back to baseline health. Does that make sense? Yeah, you're really reinforcing the point that runners need to do a lot more than just go out and run every day. And, you know, I've, I've sort of staked my coaching philosophy on this point that, you know, we need to think of ourselves as athletes. And that subtle shift in how we look at ourselves helps us do other things in our training that isn't just running. So we're going to do all of the other general health things to take care of our body, because I agree, you have to have health before you have performance. Mm -hmm. And after that, you know, we've got to be strong, we've got to be mobile, we've got to um, have supple tissues that can be elongated and can contract. And it takes some at work, you know, it takes uh, some <laughs> dynamic flexibility work. It takes some, some types of flexibility exercises, strength exercises. Um, I'm a big fan of, of getting runners to do other forms of cross training, just to train the body in a different way and, and develop more function and athleticism in, in different forms of exercise than running. So this is a very holistic perspective on injury resilience that I think is the most effective. You know, if you wanted to stay as healthy as possible, let's become the best athlete as possible. And that doesn't mean just going to run, you know, 120 miles a week and that's all you're doing. Right. I totally agree with everything you're saying. I've been a big cross trainer my entire running career, but I think because I had to be. And I just love movement and exercise. So I did a lot of, Jason, I, I pool ran so much through all of my, uh, training that I taught a class in pool running uh, for seven years before COVID. <laughs> so I'm a, a well-versed in the world of cross training. I do think it does help us, um, you know, move in different ways and re like be, have something to fall back on when it's not a good idea for us to go run. You know, there are times when it's just not good for our bodies to push it because something's going on or the things going on in our lives. And speaking of holistic, like the things that are happening in our lives, Imagine the nervous system. We've got a sympathetic system, the parasympathetic system. That sympath we, so many of us live it in our culture in the sympathetic nervous system where there's so much going on, so much tension, so much rush, so much pressure. And we really need to bring it down to balance that. Our parasympathetic system is where the resting and digesting happens. It's where the repair of tissues happens. We need that. And I know for me, having certainly had the default of... Um, Gosh, especially in my Boston and PT school and marathon racing uh, days, I was running around like crazy. So I've, I've had to really work to personally um, work to support the other parts of myself that were crying out for so many years to um, be able to, you know, be balanced and, and maybe balance is an overused word a lot now, but um, be you know, healthy and supported, support your body to be able to do the things you want to do for a really long time. Um, I think cross training can be part of that. Uh, you know, the, the simple daily habits that help us, which includes, you know, nutrition, supplements, sleep, all of that stuff, cross training, um, and having these ways that we can fall back on when it's maybe not such a great idea to to run again today or something like that. 
Yeah, listen to the PT here. You don't always <laughs> need to go for your run. And, and, and are, believe I believe me, I love, and I get it because I've been there too. And I've had it. Go, you know what? It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's also okay to take a rest day and not cross train. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my heaven forbid. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Is this more important for masters runners, the, the folks who maybe don't recover the same way that they did when they were 22 years old? Because I know that I did certain things as a 20 year old that I can no longer get away with today. Um, and, and even though I don't really feel dramatically different than, than I did 20 years ago, I just know that I have to be a little bit more cautious. And so all of these topics that we're talking about today from warming up to focusing on other types of movement and athleticism to building injury resilience into our training. This seems to be more important the older you are. Is that something you'd agree with? I would agree with that both personally now that I'm in my 40s and I feel similar to you. I can't seem to quote unquote get away with the things I maybe did and pushed through in my 20s, nor do I want to. I feel also more intelligent, um, you know, more purposeful, more the things I also learned during that time, I, I was injured a lot, you know, so I, maybe it's an interesting, uh, maybe it's part of what led to my path as a physical therapist, right, having been injured and realizing, you know, it's making me think what I, what I thought I wanted to learn by studying the body and becoming a physical therapist, which was how to not get injured. What I really learned, the hard, honest truth is that our bodies have limitations and our bodies get injured with, especially for pushing ourselves or asking a lot of it is one way I like to put it. Um, something, one of my biggest uh, key I like to give people for becoming, you know, preventing injury, becoming what I like to call injury proof is um, being able to feel your body better and actually act on what it's telling you. So for many years, I was like, sure, listen to my body. Sure, Liz. I don't, but I didn't really know what that meant. I didn't really internalize. I didn't embody what it meant to listen to my body. I was like, I can hear it. But I've also was so trained to, to ignore it and push through things. But it's such a different and more powerful, at least in my experience, it, um, thing to to run and be shuffling and worrying and, you know, feeling injured or to feel like striding and strong and powerful and so strong that I know if I got injured, it's not, it's okay. I can, I can handle it, you know? Um, and not only that, but if I feel something that feels a little off, I'm going to adjust in real time and, you know, um, keep it from worsening, handle a problem when it's small before it becomes a bigger problem. And, um, and as a PT, I, I'm a, I have a terrible business model. I love getting people healthy and, you know, independent of me. I'm a teacher at heart. So I really want people to, you know, take great care of their bodies by learning to honor it. It's fascinating and incredible what the body, the body, the whole human body can do. It's so good at healing and adapting if we know what to do to help it. It's so good at restoring itself if we know what to do to help it. So often we really just need to stop kind of, you know, uh, pushing the rock up the hill, maybe <laughs> like Sisyphus and, and, you know, find a new way, find a new path. And um, circling back to your question about um, getting older, um, possibly because I work with a lot of people who do have back problems and spine, you know, injuries specifically, but then also runners, because I am one and I get it. Um, as we get older, we can get in patterns. It's more, it's less age, more being patterned over time. And just like the mind can get in patterns, the body gets in patterns. So a lot of what I feel like I do as a, as a PT, as a professional, as a clinician is um, help kind of unravel some of the patterning that we've, you know, accumulated over time in the body and then even in our habits, right? In our lives. So. Laura, I kind of want to make this a three hour <laughs> podcast and talk about <laughs> it's not aging. It's the patterning that ha that might have to wait for, for okay. uh, the sequel to this podcast, but that that's a really fascinating idea that uh, I, I want to think more about because I, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are so good at adapting to whatever stress we put our bodies under, but if that stress is the same stress, we know that we're not going to keep getting better. We're not going to keep improving. Mm -hmm. But the flip side to that is 
if whatever stress we're experiencing is maybe not a good one, we might be kind of creating this dysfunction over time without really knowing about it. And so that to me is, is something worth thinking about. Right. It's just like how in pain science, there's a lot of research now about how you know, brain, the brain has a map, mapping of pain. It's not one, it's not, there's no pain center. So we can experience pain and not necessarily have tissue damage. And that can kind of get stuck as a pattern from having a prior injury or having prior experiences. Um, and it's, I think all truths are paradoxical. So here in this sense, aging, there are physiological, you know, um, decreases that occur with aging, hydration, tissue, things like that. Um, healing time and our bodies are really incredible and can adapt and heal if we, if we know what to do to help it. Mm -hmm. Laura, this was so informative for this. So as lacking type of coach over here. <laughs> so I, I really appreciate your knowledge and wisdom. Uh, and, and especially just more generally just about like your entire injury philosophy and, and your holistic view of the human body and, and how it relates to both performance and healing and preventing injuries. I think really interesting uh, topics for runners. Uh, I know I'm going to start thinking a little bit differently about aging now. Uh, if folks want to follow along with, with your work, uh, maybe they want to come see you in Boulder, Colorado, where can they find you? Well, first, thank you so much, Jason, for those kind words. It's really nice to feel seen and um, all those things and talk to someone who's really listening and getting it and reflecting. It was really just a, such an enjoyable conversation with you. And then, um, yeah, I am in Boulder, Colorado. So if anyone, uh, if I can serve anyone in any way, you can find me at um, www.yellowbrickpt.com. So my practice is called Yellow Brick Physical Therapy because the journey is so important <laughs> and it's Love what it. to focus on rather than the outcome and endpoint, um, just like training, right? We really have to, we really not have to, but it helps to enjoy the process. So, yep. So you can find me at yellowbrickpt.com. I also have online programs and some other things. If you're not local in Boulder that I can help people with uh, in both restoring this kind of problem, so as nerve otherwise, and um, other things I'll be, I've just written a book. So you'll uh, feel free to join my email newsletter so you can, um, you know, hear more about when that's coming. Ugh. So I'm just sending it off to editing. So it's coming soon. <laughs> well, that's very exciting. I didn't know you had just written a book. So, uh, we'll maybe update the show notes when it comes out with a link to your book. Uh, you're also on Instagram and, and share some oh, yeah. really helpful PT guidance, but also just snippets of your own running journey, which is great to see. Uh, what's your Instagram handle? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Right, you can find me on Instagram at, at Dr. Laura Johnson, L A R A, Laura, like Laura Bar, at Dr. Laura Johnson, or you can find me on Facebook um, at Laura Johnson. Cool. We will have yeah. links to that in the show notes. Dr. Laura Johnson, thanks for being here. Thank you so much. It's been a, such a pleasure.